So hi everybody, uh, welcome to this session. Uh, I'm moderating the session, I'm Simon Tanner from King's College London. Uh, we're here to talk to you about um, the uh, International Image Interoperability Framework, so IIIIF. And um, so what we're going to do is we're going to give you an introduction to this, uh, this framework. It's a community uh, that includes academics working with museums, libraries, archives, non-profits, commercial sector organisations uh, who are committed to the sharing of cultural heritage images. So in the past three years, uh, it has defined common APIs. Uh, for image delivery, and these are supported by a growing ecosystem of open source image servers and clients. So the uh, International Image Interoperability Framework, uh, IIIF, this initiative, it started small, very small, but its impact on digital cultural heritage has steadily grown with wider uptake. There was a recent event uh, in London, UK, uh, that I attended, uh, uh, which garnered attendance from a couple of dozen museums and libraries who, uh, from across Europe, and, I, and to be honest with you, I was frankly uh, astounded uh, and blown away by the capabilities and opportunities on show that day for our community. And so when uh, uh, Stuart uh, Steimer from Stanford realized I was gonna be here, he asked me if I'd moderate, and I said, I'd be really pleased to do so because uh, this is something I have a fairly strong uh, belief in. There's, you know, the benefits of common APIs and open source are increasingly evident. With common APIs, we are no longer bound to single monolithic software stacks for image delivery, so I think that's a good thing. Um, these technologies that you'll be hearing about today enable our audience to view, analyze, compare, and annotate high-resolution images from disparate image re repositories, so the ability to do even more sharing uh, is available to them within one workspace. And our ability to show very large images, even gigapixel images, uh, if we so de desire, is now a realistic capability for us all, rather than it just being something that elite museums may think um, they can achieve, so it's something for all of us. Um, but uh, we have three fine fellows here uh, who can tell us everything and we ever wanted to know about uh, IIIF and its potential application for museums. So from Stanford University Library, we have Benjamin Albritton, who's the Digital Manuscripts Program Manager there. We have Stuart Snyman, uh, who's Associate Director for Digital Strategies uh, at uh, Stanford University Libraries. And from Princeton University uh, Library, we have John Stroop, who's Digital Initiative Programmer Analyst. So let's listen to them introduce IIIF. And there will be time for questions at the end of the session. We'll make sure there's plenty of time for questions at that point. Now, you can ask them in person. Remember, these sessions are being recorded, so we will either repeat the questions back to you or if you can come to the microphone uh, to put questions or just comments or ideas into the mix. Um, but also remember, you've got the MCN 2014 uh, hashtag, but you can also use the hashtag hash I triple. Sorry, I keep going I triple. Uh, sorry. Yeah, I know. It's because it's it's in my librarian background, it's IEEE, and I can't get my head out of IEEE, so it's triple IF. Uh, so hashtag uh, triple IF, uh, and you know, use that as a place where you can ask questions as well if you're too shy to come up and talk, and I'll post them to, the, uh, to, the, to uh, our uh, speakers. So I'm going to just hand you over to them and let them do their thing, and uh, let's see what we've got. Okay, go for it, guys. Thanks, Simon, and thanks for all of you to join us this afternoon. Um, just a quick overview of what we're going to do this afternoon. Uh, I'm going to talk through a single use case. Uh, Stu is going to introduce IIIF to you, uh, its concepts and background. Uh, John is going to talk through the, the framework side of things, the actual APIs. And then we're going to talk a little bit about more use cases and software. So if you have things that you want to interrupt, please feel free to. Uh, none of us will get too rattled anyway. So I want to start off with a use case, and it's probably one that, uh, that we're all familiar with. Um, as Simon mentioned, we've got the capability now to serve out tons of very large, high-resolution images uh, for most of our institutions. So we've got this increasing amount of content that is out there. Uh, and we're trying to make a case now for interoperability for that content. So with this massive content, what can we do with it in different situations? I come from the medieval studies background, uh, and on the projects that I've worked on, 
which tend to be institution specific, uh, we continually find that our users that our users want to compare our images to images held by other institutions. This is a common use case in medieval studies. If I want to see a text that's held both in Paris and New York, either I get to fly to New York and Paris, which is unlikely, or I have to go to different sites and take a look at them. And one of the most compelling use cases in medieval studies, anyway, is dispersal of objects. Uh, there are very few medieval libraries that are still intact that people would like to study. Uh, even more, there are fewer single collections still intact uh, since the period. And quite frequently, there are, very, are increasingly few objects still intact from the medieval period. And I'd like to talk about Otto Ege, who some of you may know, uh, was a book collector, manuscript collector, in Ohio in the first part of the 20th century. And he was a great democratizer. He wanted to make sure that students and faculty across North America had access to medieval content. And so he took his collection of manuscripts and started ripping pages out of them and selling them as sets uh, across North America, sets of 50 from 50 different manuscripts, uh, as a way of exposing more people to medieval content. And I'm gonna talk about one particular manuscript of his, which is a 12th century French Bible uh, with uh, a great deal of commentary written to the margins. In 1940, this was a whole book, or at least as whole as we, we know about. Um, and by 2014, it is now held in 33 different institutions that we know about, including private collectors and also hidden in collections and uncatalogued. Uh, so this crosses libraries, private collectors, public libraries, uh, art galleries, and a number of other um, institutions like uh, archives as well. So this is a big problem for us. If, uh, if somebody wants to take a look at Stanford's collection of these leaves, we've got 18 of them, you can simply go to Stanford's website and take a look at the leaves. But you're only seeing part of the story. We've got 18 leaves spread across what were initially about 110. Uh, so you might also then go to South Carolina and see their leaf. You can go to Denison University's site and see their leaf. You can go to Digital Scriptorium. You can go to Case Western. And you can work through all of the places where these leaves are now. Well, there has to be a better way. And so I'd like to talk just a little bit about one of the better ways that we've been working with. So wouldn't it be great if our users could go to a single place and choose from all of those different images? Let's see. Bring up Case Westerns in one view. We can bring up a couple others here. Uh, Cleveland. Maybe we'll also grab one from Toronto. Here. And we can start looking at these in a single uh, viewing instance, which is already a great improvement over going to 33 different sites. <coughs> but with all of this content now available online, we can also start to rebuild some of these objects. And so one of the projects that we're working on is reunification of disbound manuscripts, which allows us to create or reconstruct the object to the best of our ability based on the content that's out there. And further, we can add to that some descriptions of the manuscript in its rebound state with a little bit of history. So we can start to engage with this object, start to rebuild it, and then start to compare content across all of the different institutions. So here we have a leaf that sold on eBay this spring, right next to a leaf from the University of Texas at Austin. And we can start to get a better sense of what the book was like when it was whole. Uh, this means that we can also uh, dig into this book a little bit further and start to compare individual leaves from different institutions, which would be impossible now. So once we've rebuilt the manuscript, we can compare leaves side by side from physically uh, distinct locations. 
Many of the institutions that, that have these leaves have filmed just one side, uh, something that we see in, in many different types of use cases, like paintings front and back and things like that. But we can still put in placeholders for those leaves for some future date. And even when we don't know exactly where in the book something falls, so we have a set of leaves here that unfortunately the side that had the page number on it was not imaged, but we can figure out from the text where in a range of images that might belong. And then we can start comparing those leaves in detail to the point of zooming in and checking the, the um, paleographical hand uh, to make sure that this is an, indeed uh, a unified book uh, if we didn't already believe that. And further then, we can move on to build new interactive presentations. So we can invite people into the book uh, and we've been working with students at Stanford to transcribe the manuscript, make those annotations viewable, which we hope to uh, show you a little bit later. Uh, as well as providing uh, a point where a scholar could come back and uh, actually do a study of the book as a whole <coughs> across it. Now, all of this is driven by the IIIF APIs, and I'd like to turn over to Stu at this point uh, to talk you through that particular uh, set of information. All right. My name is Stu Schneiben. I'm the Associate Director for uh, Digital Strategy at the Stanford University Libraries. And, um, what I'd like to do is give you a brief uh, overview of IIIF, its history, a little bit of context at a high level. And I'll let John is going to come up and dive a little bit deeper into the technology. But before I begin, I'd like to start with a few statements that uh, many of us in the library community at least have made about our image um, and collection delivery environments and wonder whether or not you've had any of the same thoughts. So I'm locked into my image delivery software. I need a newer, faster uh, image delivery environment and I can't spend much time um, uh, or money on it. I want deep zoom on my website. I want to provide a richer, more immersive, um, interactive experience uh, with my institution's images on the web. And it actually also has to work on mobile. I want to allow my users to visually compare objects side by side in my collection. And I'd also like to be able to compare those images with objects that are similar in other collections. I want to make it easy for my users to cite and share my images and regions of those images in a persistent way. I want to allow embedding of my images in, in blogs and web pages, but carry with it the rights and attribution that are appropriate. I want to allow visitors to annotate images online to improve um, to enrich the resource and improve the user experience. And dare I say, I really feel like I shouldn't have to reinvent it or invent it myself. <coughs> These are some of the questions uh, that we were asking um, as we were thinking about um, improving the experience for our users online. Images are fundamental carrier carriers of cultural heritage. Uh, increasingly, our online uh, versions of images um, are the means by which we convey the value and richness of our physical collections to a broad audience. But, alas, uh, digital image delivery is, um, in my opinion, unsatisfying. Uh, it's hard to do well. It can often be uh, underperformant. Um, it's, it's, it, it can be expensive. It's, dis it's disjointed. When you move from site to site, you have a different experience. Um, and there are lots of negative consequences to that. There are negative consequences for software developers, for system administrators, for collection managers, for users. And not to mention our systems and websites often are like silos. Um, we love this, the irony of this image, because um, you see the silos and that one says co-op. Um, um, but our image repositories, our web servers, our asset management systems, um, are, are, are often siloed. They're built as, um, as kind of individual, not interoperable, closed systems. Um, our front-end applications are, are usually one-offs. And when moving to site, from site to site, users have to relearn um, how to engage with the resources. So as Ben said, there's got to be a better way. Um, this is an image of uh, a, na a napkin uh, that was drawn on at a Cuban restaurant. Um, and I don't know what year, it was about four years ago, um, as we were working on a project uh, uh, with Ben's leadership on unifying digital medieval manuscripts and creating an interoperability, an interoperable environment for those scholars who want to study uh, manuscript content um, that are hosted at multiple institutions. 
So this is how all this was born. And we speculated that this was not a use case that applies exclusively to medieval manuscript content. It uh, applies to newspapers and photographs and um, paintings and other kinds of uh, artwork, um, images of all types. And this is how the notion of IIIF was born. Um, the vision of IIIF has been to create a global framework by which image-based resources, any kind of image-based resource, from any institution, um, using any compatible image server or asset management environment, um, can be displayed, uh, manipulated, and annotated in any application uh, for any user on the web in any combination of elements. Ambitious. Uh, tens of, we imagine tens or hundreds of millions of image-based resources in this ecosystem um, backed by a consortium of um, committed cultural heritage and research institutions who are committed to um, rich use uh, uh, of image resources supported by a growing suite of compatible software tools. So we don't have to build them, so they're out there. The ones that we're using are already compatible. And importantly, incorporating uh, the best uh, of uh, uh, online technologies, and importantly, um, web standards. Uh, web standards for um, accessibility, for, um, for mobile. Um, so we, we're, we're committed to kind of taking advantage of common web standards. So what exactly is, when we talk about Triple Live, we're talking about a lot, we say a lot, what exactly is it? So it's two APIs. Um, and John's going to dive a little bit deeper into those APIs. I'll mention them in just, in, in just a second. There's a growing ecosystem of software, and there's a thriving community. So the two APIs, uh, without stealing John's thunder, um, one of them is called the Image API. It delivers, uh, it's, a, it's a RESTful API that delivers pixels to the browser. Uh, most of our digital asset management and image server environments have one of these, but they're all different. Um, the second API is a presentation API which delivers enough information to a client um, to deliver uh, that object to the web in a useful and logical way. So just deliver the pixels to the browser and organize the images or images associated with an object in a logical way. Second, compatible software. So there is actually already an emerging software ecosystem that is IIIF compatible that supports these two APIs. Um, the Internet Archive Book Reader, um, uh, the Welcome Library in London has a uh, universal media player that they've built that's being supported in a number of institutions uh, in the UK that's IIIF compatible. I'll show, hopefully, a nice live demo of some software that Harvard and Stanford are building with support of the community. Um, other technologies that many of you may already have in your technology stacks, OpenSea Dragon is natively IIIF compliant, IIP MoViewer is natively IIIF compliant, um, open, open Layers, and then on the server side, um, the way we get our images actually out, there's a, a growing number of technologies that are already um, capable of delivering images using the IIIF APIs. Um, J2K is something we use in the library community quite often, um, IIP server. Um, John actually developed a native IIIF server client called, er, server called Loris, um, and some even the commercial uh, image servers that are used uh, have either shims that are published or um, are becoming IIIF compatible. Uh, and then the third aspect of IIIF, we've got the, the APIs, the software, and I think maybe most importantly is the community. Um, it started off small with maybe a half a dozen institutions talking about this, and at this point the community consists of upwards of nine national libraries who have all made commitments to um, make their image resources IIIF compatible. Um, a number of research institutions, including C2RMF, which is the research institute associated with the Louvre, um, and a number of uh, academic research libraries in the U.S. and Europe. Um, we've got uh, a small but important number of museums, and this is why we're here, to talk to the museum community about um, the, the potential of IIIF for you. Um, the uh, Yale Center for um, uh, British Art and the British Museum. Um, very importantly, we've also been in, uh, in heavy discussion with many aggregators that we're all familiar with. Um, Art Store has been a participant in IIIF development and discussion from the beginning. Uh, we are also uh, have had participation in our meetings and API development with DPLA, the Digital Public Library of America, and Europeana. So these are really powerful um, allies. Um, 
because they're big distributors of our image resources. Um, and then a number of, of, of research projects. Um, the way the community organizes itself, we typically have uh, a, one or two events a year, as Simon mentioned. We recently had a successful event in London, uh, which attracted about 120 people from not just the UK, but elsewhere in the US and, and, and Europe. Um, we have a, uh, an open call to anybody who's interested and in, wants to participate every other week. We typically get anywhere from 10 to 25 participants from, you know, sometimes as many institutions uh, on the call talking about latest developments, vetting new aspects of the specifications, seeing demos of software, um, asking for help, uh, making suggestions. So that's, a, that's an open call. Um, and we've got a list. Of course, we have a list, triplif-discuss, that uh, has grown over the years, probably has uh, closer to 140 or 150 members since we've been doing these events of late. Um, and one of your assignments once you leave, or maybe while you're in the middle, um, is to subscribe to IIIF Discuss, um, just to kind of start to be, to be informed. Um, so this is the way the community is organized. I'll close and I'm going to hand it over to, to John in a, in a minute. I'll talk just quickly about a review of what we think the benefits of having this three-tiered approach, the APIs, the software, and the community. Um, we believe that there's opportunity for richer image delivery. Zoom, pan, rotate, deep engagement with image content. Um, plug and play software. What this means is if you have uh, IIIF compatible servers or IIIF compatible clients on the front end and you decide you grow tired of either one of them, as long as they support the same API, you can just swap them out. So if you decide to swap out your client, you're not bound to your server, right? You don't have to make changes to your server. If you swap out your server, you don't have to change your client. Um, so interchangeable software. Um, publish once, reuse often. So I can publish my image um, or my object via the, uh, the, the APIs, and I can reuse them in my local environment. And if it's permissible, um, kind of rights dependent, it can be used in other environments. It can be shared um, in blogs. It can be used in other, in other software environments. Um, the ability to remix content, um, either from your own repository or remixing content from, with, with your uh, collections and others, maybe to create virtual exhibits, um, is one use case for the remixing of content. The ability to cite and share um, with uh, well-formed and persistent uh, URLs. It's very annotation friendly. So the IIIF um, uh, participants have been in clo closely aligned with something called the Open Annotation Community, um, which is another web standard for annotating content on the web. Um, and the, uh, the APIs, technologies, and standards of IIIF and open annotation um, are, are highly compatible. Um, so we see annotation of image resources on the web as it's already big and it's going to be a, a um, much more important way for us to um, create a participatory experience with our collections. Um, we recognize that not all images can be sent around the web freely, that there are important constraints uh, on access and important um, um, requirements for attribution and IIIF supports um, those constraints. Um, we're working on extensions to the API to support authorization authentication um, and with IIIF is actually a good mechanism um, for, for carrying some of that attribution and rights information with your image in different environments. And then finally and importantly, um, kind of participation in a large and growing community um, of, of like-minded institutions that are committed to, um, to supporting research, exposure, and use of cultural heritage, heritage objects around the world. Um, it's, a, it's a real supportive group, um, and we're real committed to helping people, um, other institutions, kind of get bootstrapped. Um, so these are some of the, some of the benefits we see. Um, we're going to uh, we're going to turn to John now, and we're going to do a little bit of a deeper dive into the technical parts. I think it's important to kind of understand the, uh, um, the kind of underpinnings of the technology, um, and then we'll spin back up and do some, and do some, do some demos. John? So really, I mean, what, what better thing could you think of to do than like, you know, after lunch, third day of a conference, middle of that session, you know, to read some specs. Uh, we're not going to do that. <laughs> uh, I'm going to take you on a slightly deeper dive. I'm not even going to bring the specs up on the screen. I would encourage you, if you have uh, some more uh, uh, 
interested in what I talk about, to go to our website, IIIF.io, click on technical details, links to two nice long technical documents uh, written by uh, myself and a few uh, co-editors. And um, uh, as both Stu and uh, Ben uh, have said, we're always welcome to feedback uh, on those. <coughs> Okay, so as you've heard already, there's two uh, API specifications. Uh, one for getting at images and their metadata, and uh, another about sort of presenting uh, images and related uh, uh, content. Um, before we go too far into those, I, I kind of want to uh, reiterate uh, a point that Stu made, which is uh, about you know why would we want to standardize APIs in the first place? Um, and, and maybe this is an obvious statement already, but this is where a lot of us are or were uh, even just a few years ago. We have sort of locked in siloed solutions, right? You have application A that works with server A. You get the picture. Uh, when you introduce standards, uh, technology becomes interchangeable and you can see the my ingenious color coding that the uh, the servers have all shifted one to the right here and and you can you get you get plug and play you, you can swap uh, different uh, clients of your choosing whether it's because they fit your domain they're just what your users are useful uh, used to um, whatever you can make them talk to your your uh, server of choice uh, and you're not locked into a, a complete sort of vertical solution uh, so technology becomes interchangeable uh, and finally, uh, of course, most uh, important to our early goals is that technology, I'm uh, sorry, uh, content becomes shareable. Uh, it's not just you having the ability to pull content off of your own servers, but as, as Ben uh, demonstrated, bringing your applications to where the content is rather than the other way around, which is what we're um, more used to having to try. Uh, okay, so let's uh, jump into the image API uh, a little bit. And I want to start by saying that I'm going to do a bunch of typing of URLs to sort of prove and demonstrate what I'm talking about. Uh, the assumption with these APIs is that most of the time that's not what you'd be doing, right? That you have client software that lets you draw boxes or knows how to make tile requests or uh, one way or another, this, this syntax gets encapsulated, this API gets uh, encapsulated by a richer client that's further uh, uh, upstream in your uh, stack. That said, uh, if you've ever worked, I think this is from J2K that I, that I copied this, if you've ever worked with a lot of other image servers, you get these very long, sort of cumbersome, you know, behemoth URLs that, that break when you try to email them and you're gonna forget writing them down. Uh, we have these nice sort of persistent uh, URLs that deliver just enough information uh, to consistently recreate uh, uh, the same image. So you can see um, the first URL at the top there, URI uh, syntax there is for getting at the uh, information on. I think the battery's dead. <laughs> uh, the first one is for getting at the image with this ID. Uh, get, sorry, getting inf information about that image. Uh, the second is for getting at thanks, getting at uh, an image uh, or a derivative image of the image with that ID, right? So you can specify the region, the size, should it be rotated uh, and or mirrored. Um, What's the quality? Should it be color, grayscale? Uh, should the server just choose, which is the, the value default in that slot? And finally, uh, what's the format? JPEG, ping, GIF, uh, Google, uh, WebP is a format a few of us uh, support. Uh, and one other thing before a demo is that uh, one of the important aspects of that syntax is that these uh, transformations, if you will, are applied in order, right? So. Uh, as you saw in the URL syntax, right, it's region, size, rotation, quality, format. You take the region of an image, resize it, 
mirror it if that's part of the request, rotate, and then uh, uh, adjust the quality, and of course, ultimately, serialize that uh, in, a, in a format. Um, the reason this is important, of course, is that if you resized first and then took the region, for example, you'd wind up with a very different uh, set of pixels. So, let's tempt the uh, Wi-Fi here. Do we have this one? This one. So we're going to start with this uh, very big uh, image that my colleague Roel back there shot uh, just last week, actually. Uh, maybe the week before. Uh, it's a big uh, set of chromolithography proofs. It's a pretty big image, and you can see we have these different sort of regions that may be uh, of particular interest. Uh, okay, so you're going to bear with me while I type and start to take this apart. Uh, click here. So let's say I'm interested in this little scene here. I can't even really see what it is. Uh, I know, again, because I'm pretending like I'm a client uh, further upstream, uh, that to get at that particular region, I need to go 3,000. 930 pixels to the right, 60 pixels down, 1,230 pixels over, 3,600 pixels down, right? And so now we've pulled out the little scene that was in the top right corner. Um, this is still quite a big image. I wouldn't want to send it around. It'd be difficult to say. It doesn't really fit in a browser. It's more load. Uh, than your bandwidth uh, needs to support. So let's size it down. The second slide here, uh, there's quite a number of ways, about a half a dozen different ways to request different sizes uh, using the IIIF image API. Uh, one of the most powerful ones in this situation is the ability to specify an optimal width and height, but then also tell the server to not uh, distort the aspect ratio, uh, which we do by putting a bang in front of that optimal width and height. So I'm going to, or an exclamation mark. Uh, sorry, developer speak. I don't get above the ground that often. Uh, okay, so 1024 by 1024 optimally. Don't distort it. Uh, and don't go bigger than 1024 or 1024. Right, so now we've got, if I undo the browser scaling, much more manageable uh, size, right? The next and most obvious thing we probably should have done first is rotate it, right? 90 degrees, uh, it's starting to look like the thing we're interested in and be sort of uh, legible. It's worth pointing out, um, not so applicable to this use case, that if we put a exclamation mark in front of the rotation, we get Oh, and we're rotated this way. So we're getting a reflection. We've already rotated. So it's effectively mirroring the image. Uh, I can demonstrate that better if I go back to the non-rotated version. Yeah, there we go. Right, so we have a mirror uh, of the non-rotated version. And then, uh, as you'd expect. Uh, Another interesting aspect of the rotation is most servers only do um, rotation by uh, 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 multiples of, of 90. Um, the spec doesn't limit you to that, so you can see we've got this funny black margin uh, along the bottom here. If we want to get fancy, we can try to level it out a little bit. Uh, let's go back. Finally, uh, two left actually. Uh, as I said, we can change the quality, get a grayscale version. Get a bitonal version. Uh, this 
particular server, uh, Loris, also lets you choose between just a straight threshold, uh, everything above you know, this color should be black, anything below should be white, uh, or uh, turn on a dithering uh, function that gives you something that looks much closer to a, a grayscale uh, representation. And then finally, uh, you can do a ping, uh, which of course is gonna look exactly the same. Uh, we can do... We thought about that, you know, because we've got the rotation there, like all the pieces are there, you know, but yeah, yeah, we're waiting for that use case, so, you know, triple I have to discuss. Uh, and then uh, I think the last format this one supports is uh, Google's WebP format. Uh, okay, so that's, that's the uh, image API, and again, I've walked you through something that we would not normally expect uh, humans uh, to do, but this is the power that's now sort of afforded to your uh, software. And the nice thing about having a standard API, of course, is that um, we know there's a Drupal module uh, in development for building these requests. Um, uh, it's pretty trivial with JavaScript because it actually is sort of native to the uh, syntax. Um, but I think it's still important to sort of demonstrate how easy it can be. Let's bring this back up. Okay, uh, so the presentation API, um, a bit more of a complex topic. Um, complex, but it, it's fairly easy to, to sort of sum up what it is and what it, what it isn't. Um, so when you're trying to, when you have a bunch of content that sort of taken in aggregate represents uh, a book or a manuscript or a triptych or a diptych or some real world uh, object, you need a way to tie all that content together. You need a way to uh, associate some metadata uh, with that content with the goal of displaying uh, that object uh, accurately and, and making it as close to a sort of stand-in uh, surrogate for the, uh, the real world object on the web. Uh, because you're on the web, you also want to support things that you can't do in person like you know, annotation. Uh, so that, that's what it is. What it's not, for those of you who've seen this before, it's not one of these. It's not another content standard. It's not another set of descriptive metadata semantics. Um, it really is agnostic about all of those things. And maybe some of you have been in this situation before where your repository has a bunch of really rich metadata and, you know, you've carefully sort of crafted that and, you know, it's got authority control and it's got you know, all this wonderful stuff, subject headings that are you know, from the right authority, blah, blah, blah. Uh, you've got a web developer who's not from your space at all and has all this structured XML or all these tables or whatever. And she says, you know, can I just get some labels and, and values? Like, I, just, I just need to spit these out in HTML and I need to you know, flip through these images. So, so that's the sweet spot we're trying to, to hit here, right? It's not a content standard, it's not uh, a transmission standard, it's not a descriptive metadata standard, it's a data structure for serving, uh, helping web developers to build rich clients and therefore helping users to have a, a sort of rich uh, viewing experience. So, so just enough structure and data to accomplish that goal. So we're going to talk through the sort of five core parts of the um, presentation API, and frankly, they're best explained by um, uh, examples. So what we're going to do is we're going to walk up through this graph, starting with content in Canvas, sequence, manifest in collection, and I'm going to sort of try to show you uh, how each of those parts function and what they, what they sort of do for us. Uh, so the first two, Canvas and content, uh, are, are actually easier to um, explain um, together. And the notion of a canvas actually grows out of some work that uh, uh, Ben and um, another of our colleagues, Rob Sanderson, did as part of the DMS technical working group. Yes, good, all right. Uh, uh, which which uh, introduces uh, the, the, the shared canvas uh, 
data model. And in both the shared canvas data model and the AAAF presentation API, the sort of fundamental building block is this notion of a canvas. Um, all a canvas represents is the notion of a thing somewhere in the world, uh, a, a notion of a physical unit, right? Um, as we saw with Ben, you know, there were, uh, with the, with the auto uh, example, they know these things exist, they don't have images of them. It's nice to be able to say this thing exists, here's a blank canvas uh, 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 to hold its place. Um, following the canvas uh, metaphor and the shared canvas uh, data model, one can then take content and paint it uh, onto a canvas. Um, you can sort of think of it like a PowerPoint slide, right? So you start out with this sort of blank slate and you start to you know, sort of chuck stuff on it and, and, and layer it and, and write little notes and annotate it. Uh, so it can really be anything. Obviously we're uh, in a heavy sort of uh, image space, but it's really not limited to that. I mean, we've seen interesting demos from the British Library where they've put YouTube videos on top of canvases. Um, uh, and then of course the, the big use case you've heard us talk about uh, already, transcriptions, uh, commentary, OCR, text. Um, so, so it's a blank slate. Um, most of the time, at least in the sort of digital book manuscript uh, art world, we find that it's 90% of the time it's, it's image content and then maybe some annotations. So if we, so, so back to our sort of structure diagram here, we've got content in the form of an image and we've got a canvas. Uh, we're gonna paint that image. Uh, imagine that image has been painted onto uh, a canvas. Okay, so the next step up the ladder here is uh, the sequence. And sequence uh, is all about ordering. Uh, essentially, and uh, in the in the manuscript use case, uh, I'm going to bring up some screenshots from a demo you're going to see later. Um, sequence allows us to do uh, a number of things. Paging probably being the most obvious, right? You need to put these images in in a logical um, order. The API has uh, mechanisms in place for for bringing out when, for example. Uh, a page is a duplicate or a canvas should be skipped when you're in a paging sequence. Um, you can say this should be paged left to right or right to left or bottom to top or top to bottom. Um, we've got some collections of Arabic calendars that actually I think it's bottom to top. Um, it lets you do film strips uh, or reference strips or whatever you want to call this navigation uh, uh, bit along the bottom here. Uh, and then of course the ever useful uh, uh, sort of reference microfilm, microfiche view of, of a bunch of thumbnails um, in, in order. So sequence gives us that um, quite easily. Um, it's worth mentioning there's a, a slightly more advanced mechanism, not a feature I should say, that I'm, not going to go into too much detail about, uh, but the API has a notion of ranges uh, as well. So you can see this manuscript has sort of a table of contents view, uh, lost it along the side here, and uh, with some inherent structure. And uh, ranges make it possible uh, to do that. And then uh, I don't know if they're going to show this later, but it will. You can expand and collapse uh, uh, as you'd expect. Okay, working back up, uh, a manifest, you can probably guess by its name, uh, is the sort of aggregation of all of this, uh, all of this content, these canvases, their content, uh, put into a sequence or, or more than one sequence, possibly ranges, aggregated into one uh, uh, JSON LD document. And all that content can either be embedded in the manifest directly or because Linked data is kind of the lingua franca here. The manifest can be a set of URIs that you dereference to get that next bit of content. Both, both uh, are possible. Um, and finally, collection sort of speaks for itself. You can, and, and the, 
So we're saying collection is, is a recursive structure. So you can have collections of collections um, that pull together manifests. And again, just sort of to see, make that clear uh, in the Mirador viewer here, right? You have this uh, vertical list of collections and a, uh, a manifest on each of the sort of horizontal, uh, horizontal blocks. Okay, just quickly, uh, the API does specify some properties. Uh, most of the parts require a label, uh, a description, like an abstract or any sort of, you know, a sentence about what this is is optional, a thumbnail is optional. Uh, the sort of keys and values with no semantics I was talking about earlier, those go uh, in the metadata slot. And again, it's really just about losing this thing, uh, labels and values, and, that, and that's all. We don't, it's not Dublin Core title, uh, for example, or uh, I don't know, uh, a mods title or something. It's, it's just a label. We don't, we don't care about what that field actually is. We care. We don't care here. Uh, I care. Uh, we also, of course, let you bring out uh, licensing, attribution, uh, an attribution data once intended to be a URI that links out to uh, more information about what your rights are with this this thing, um, and then attribution uh, our our spec says must always be displayed alongside the uh, or somewhere on the screen with the with the object. A logo uh, obviously is nice for branding as well when you're pulling content from different sources, and then linking. Um, because we don't introduce any uh, sort of bibliographic or, or other sort of content semantics, uh, but there is a desire to, for example, present um, uh, geospatial information about a resource, we introduce this notion of service, which says you can basically stick a URI here or put information in line following somebody else's schema um, so GeoJSON-LD would be the case uh, uh, for geospatial information. You can stick that in a, in a service uh, and um, it's almost like an extension mechanism. See also if you have uh, a, a truly semantic metadata source, a CDWA Lite uh, file or a, a, a mods or a mark file or, or whatever, you can point to that there. And then any other related uh, content, sort of a generic catch-all. Maybe you have sort of an exemplar uh, instantiation of this, uh, of this uh, manifest and you want to point to it, um, say, in, in an exhibition or in your library catalog or in your, uh, some website, some blog or something, uh, you can point to it there. Uh, the way the Mirador viewer makes use of these are in this little drawer, you can, it's a little fuzzy on the screen, but in this little drawer you can pull out that again just renders keys and values. Um, just briefly, because I haven't talked about serialization at all, uh, the, uh, both the image APIs, um, uh, image information syntax, which I'm realizing I forgot to show, and the presentation API um, use JSON-LD for their serialization uh, syntax. And the um, nice thing about JSON-LD is it really hits a, a sweet spot. If you've got a developer who just doesn't care and needs JavaScript because they're building a, uh, a JavaScript application, this is, this is native for them and they don't have to think about it. If you want you know, to pull out richer sort of semantics, uh, then you can uh, dereference the document's context and, and, and turn this into other flavors of, of RDF that might be more uh, familiar to you. Uh, so to quote our, our colleague Rob, uh, curly, curly brackets are the new angle brackets. Uh, this is what one of those serializations might look like, although they tend to be much bigger, but it's, it's just a regular um, JavaScript uh, uh, object. That's the presentation API. Just a few notes about future work uh, that so we have this uh, very sort of democratic process of gathering use cases and uh, sort of arguing about them and then pulling them together, getting more use cases, trying to write a spec, getting feedback on that spec. And these are sort of the four areas that emerged out of our um, 
meeting in, in London a few weeks ago. Um, most of them have been on the radar a lot longer, but these are the four that we sort of have said need to come up now. Uh, uh, auth and auth are probably the most, um, most important. I think we've gone in some ways as, as far as we can in our communities with open content, or at least with the current partners, um, uh, until we can really uh, tackle auth in a way that's friendly to our APIs. It's easy for any repository right now to turn content on or off. Um, what we'd like to approach is that sort of gray area where maybe you can, you can get at this, but you're gonna have a degraded experience. You know, if you're fully authenticated and you're, you're the most privileged sort of user we know about, then you can get color images. But maybe uh, if you're you know, in the public and you've registered for an account, but you're not the most uh, special whatever user, uh, you can get a grayscale uh, version of the image. You can get a watermarked version. So how can we hit that sort of space of, of degraded but not no <laughs> uh, uh, access? Um, so that's, that's the current sort of work there. Um, searching within a manifest, so once you've found uh, uh, an object, uh, can we specify um, either a query syntax that's sort of as lightweight as the rest of our specs uh, and or uh, a return um, syntax so that, so that search results can come back in a, in a meaningful and expected way that, that again, different clients can uh, interpret. Uh, discovery. Um, so you're in your institution's catalog uh, or some institution's catalog and you discover an object you're interested in, how can we advertise to you that there's also a manifest available for this and you can virtually drag it into your uh, uh, analytical environment, whether it's Mirador or the Welcome Player uh, or, or whatever, to have a more sort of custom and native uh, experience. Uh, and finally, CRUD, uh, or at least the CUD in CRUD, right? So any persistent storage system generally supports four verbs, create, read, update, and delete. Um, everything about IIIF right now uh, has to do with reading. Um, what would it mean to develop a service that allows you to create content on a server? Two use cases being, I have this image I wanna put up on this image server uh, as part of a workflow, uh, for example. Can we standardize that over HTTP? Another use case would be, uh, a tool that supports um, third-party annotations, and can we create uh, a standard service for sending those uh, annotations to a server? Uh, the use for update, same story, except the thing you want to create already exists, and you want to overwrite it, update it, and delete sort of speaks for itself. Uh, that's what I have. Who's up next? Is it Stu? All right, thanks. Okay, so you've gone deep. That was awesome. Um, and now what we're going to do is we're going to show you how um, how the IIIF technology kind of manifests itself in software. Um, so as we said, there's a, a, a growing ecosystem of software that's been uh, adapted or to support um, IIIF. Um, and I want to kind of mention a couple in particular. Um, I wanted to mention IIP Image or IIP Move Viewer because I know that's a popular uh, client in the museum community. And Reuven Pillay, who is uh, uh, the creator and maintainer of that, he's at our London event. He's been a good friend of our um, and participant in the IIIF initiative. And he's put a lot of effort into making IIP, both server and viewer, um, IIIF compatible. Um, so many of you may know about IIP Image and you can check it out at, at, at the site. Um, uh, he deals with uh, very large images. He's got tools to um, apply corrections to images on the fly so you can do a comparison of different states of the image. Um, it works on multiple platforms. Um, and it's used by a variety of cultural heritage institutions around the world, several museums, libraries, um, uh, not-for-profit institutions, um, and also it's used uh, somewhat heavily in STEM. Um, and it's got a uh, pretty full uh, 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 API support um, for IIIF. Um, so, so that's an important, um, important point. Um, Stanford and Harvard have been working on a piece of software that we call Mirador. 
Um, and Mirador has kind of been our effort to really manifest all of the power of the APIs um, in a demonstration client. Um, it, was, uh, it was originally um, conceived of, and this is already a use case that Ben has, ben has talked about, so I'm not going to run through it too quickly. It's the manuscript scholar who wants to see images from multiple institutions, and he has to go to four different places to see them, and they're different experiences. Um, and then we imagined a viewer that um, allowed us to see the content um, all in one workspace and allows us to compare side by side and zoom in in, in depth and actually even create annotations um, on images from a variety of, of institutions. So this is, this is what was conceived of the software that we call Mirador. Um, it's, it's a, it's a multi-window image viewing and comparison workspace. It's open source. It's, sorry. That's okay. Is that annotation that you showed, is that an OAC? Okay, so um, the annotation component is something that's a work in progress, so that's a mock. Um, the annotation that we are, the annotation um, uh, client that we're going to integrate with Mirador is called Annotator, and the goal is to make it completely OAC compliant um, in the creation and storage of those annotations. So absolutely. I and mean, I can talk a little bit about the roadmap for Mirador um, as well. I know I'm moving a little quickly through this session because uh, I want to let Ben get to his, his, last, um, his last demo. But yeah, the annotation creation will be fully OAC compliant. That is a stated intention and goal um, of, of, of the project. Um, so let's have a look at, um, at, at Mirador. And you've seen screenshots of it. I want to show it to you live just so you can kind of get a sense of it. And I just kind of wanted to tempt the, 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 the gods. Um, so this is kind of a, a um, the kind of the, the load window. Now, this is uh, preloaded with content from a variety of institutions, um, Harvard, Yale, Stanford, uh, the Bodleian. Um, I don't know if, they, if those are the four kind of in the demo. Um, we actually have ability, if we know the manifest URI, to put it in there and add it to the workspace. Um, you can also imagine a scenario where you're in your discovery environment, you're on your website, you search for content, and you click a checkbox next to the five different objects that you want to compare to each other, and you invoke Mirador that way. So there are a couple of different ways you can invoke the software. We've kind of pre-populated the software with, um, with these couple of, of, uh, of, of, of items. So I add a, 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 an item in my workspace, um, and I can do kind of very kind of typical things that I might want to do. I can page through them. Um, I, can, I can do deep zoom and pan. It's fairly performant. Um, you notice we have the, the, the film strip below, so I can easily navigate um, through the object. Um, and you can see the table of contents on the left synchronizes with the, um, the, the navigation of the object. I can also use the table of contents as my organizing principle, um, and I can move quickly to items here. And again, I can do some nice, um, some nice deep zoom and pan. We have other viewing modalities in addition to kind of this basic single image view. Of course, we have the thumbnail view, um, which allows us to kind of see, um, navigate the, the object using thumbnails. Um, we have something called um, uh, horizontal scroll view. Um, in a lot of cases, we don't know in metadata whether or not uh, something's recto inverso, whether they're actually facing pages, but we know that scholars or people want to be able to see the openings between pages. So we developed this view to allow the user to scroll horizontally um, without necessarily knowing what's recto and what's verso. And it's also a book viewer. Um, so we have the two-page um, two navigation view. So it's also um, a book viewer that um, allows us to do Synchronized zoom of the two pages pretty much in depth. Um, so kind of these are the basics. It's got a metadata view, which John showed you. It's got a pretty functional um, full screen view. Um, this is a nice way to kind of navigate an object on your screen. Um, this uses OpenSea Dragon, so it's kind of software that's wrapped around the OpenSea Dragon stack. And Ian Gilman, who is the developer and maintainer of OpenSea Dragon, has been working with us um, to make improvements to OpenSea Dragon and also support IIIF. 
Um, so in addition to kind of the basic views, this was conceived of as a comparison tool. So I can actually open up a double workspace view. So now, if I want to look at, say, two sides of the same coin side by side, I can go to my nifty collection of Roman coins, and I can load the front of the coin, and I can load the back of the coin, and now I have um, zoomable versions of, uh, these are actually very small coins, so can't zoom too much, um, but I can do comparison workspaces. I can also create two by two comparison workspaces, four by four comparison workspaces, um, and in a developmental model, um, we can actually, um, we, we can imagine a free form mode where I can kind of arrange um, the objects any way I see fit. Um, so you can imagine the scholar who wants to look at lots of different, the researcher wants to look at lots of different uh, objects on a workspace, creating a workspace like this. Um, that same user might want to, they might zoom and pan into a specific instance of a comparison view and they might want to share it. So we've got the, mo the notion of bookmarking a workspace so that um, when I copy the, the URI to the workspace, I can then send it to a colleague who can open it up um, in a new browser in you know, incognito mode and they say the exact state of, of my comparison. Um, so you can imagine being able to share, bookmark, share, comparisons of objects, maybe even with annotations as part of that shared workspace. Sure. Uh, you just showed the, the combined use of uh, Mirador and um, OpenSea Dragon. Yes. Can you explain uh, what, which one, which uh, does? Yeah, so, so the, the, the OpenSea Dragon bit, is third tab to my left, this one, maybe? So this is kind of pure Open Sea Dragon. So this is the Princeton scroll. Um, in Mirador, uh, Open Sea Dragon is only used for the deep zoom. So whether it's deep zoom on a single image or deep zoom on the double, on the side by side views, um, it just fills the viewport with the zoom component. Everything else is Mirador, also open source. Um, we also have imagined a couple of the, um, so I'll just kind of finish with the demo here. We've got the comparison mode. Um, uh, we've got a couple other, let me uh, switch the workspace back to a single object view and show you one last item, just to kind of give you a sense, the Harvard, uh, Harvard Library is um, gonna, is, is helping co-develop um, uh, uh, Mirador, and they've put some of their um, photographs of, uh, of 3D objects in, um, just to kind of give us a sense of what's possible um, uh, in, in kind of this modality. Um, so, so that is uh, that is Mirador. Um, I think that's a that's a that's a kind of a reasonable compartmentalization. Um, the the sequence the sequencing of images the navigation through images uh, page by page is actually part of Mirador. OpenSea Dragon also has that capability of doing a film strip. We we're not using that collection mode. Although Ian is working on um, rewriting collection mode to handle um, multiple images in a single workspace in a more elegant way, and he's almost done with that. He's going to commit it. He said before Thanksgiving. But. And this is recorded, sorry. Um, and just wanted to kind of give you a, this is a, a quick picture. Uh, uh, the Fogg Museum at, at Harvard, as I said, they've been great collaborators in, in, in Harvard has been great collaborators in working on this. Uh, they, they, they assembled a, a, a touchscreen uh, video wall. I think it's a, it's a three by three uh, video wall with nine screens. And they loaded Mirador, a Mirador instance, and they started interacting with the content on the video wall. And they kind of sent us this picture because it was kind of exciting for us to see how this might be um, used in a very interactive way. We're imagining something called a Zen mode. Um, 
So two things that are important about Mirador is where we can strip down some of the Chrome and some of that swap workspace and load windows so that you could use it on a kiosk type system or embed a view in a blog post or in a web page without providing the user the ability to do too much interacting of swapping out um, window sizes and things like that. So, um, so these are some of the things that we've been working on. This is a little bit of an old roadmap. We have an aspiration of um, deploying this uh, to production in the middle of January. Um, the, the MOOC that Harvard's doing on the, on the history of the book is happening in the next quarter. So um, that helps us with a little bit of a deadline. Um, right now, the team is working hard on the making annotations and viewing annotations with the annotator and the Zen modes and embed, which I didn't really, wasn't able to demonstrate that. Um, so this is Mirador. You can follow us on GitHub. Um, you can give it a try. It's a, a fully IIIF compatible uh, client. Um, I think I'll end the demo portion there because I want to leave room for a few more questions and Ben is going to close with what we think is a, a, a good kind of set of use cases um, or a good use case that will help us bring it home for the, for the museum community. And Michael shared with us a number of slides. They're in an interesting position at Yale, in one that many of us are familiar with, where there's a technical team tasked with supporting a number of different uh, museum and library institutions within <clears throat> the university. So uh, Michael has some specific requirements from the Yale Center for British Art. Uh, they wanted um, support for panning and zooming, uh, and they are using the IIP Move Viewer. So this is part of their stack, uh, and they wanted to keep it that way, uh, as well as some other discovery uh, and support issues that they handle, which means they're serving out a lot, a lot of large uh, paintings uh, in a uniform way for the Center for British Art. At the same time, there's a collection of musical instruments at Yale. Uh, they are using a similar, at least parallel, uh, set of front-end technologies. Um, and Michael needed a way of tying all of this together in the back end. At the same time, uh, as the art type objects, they also have prints, books, things like that, bound objects that you might find uh, either in a special collections library or in the particular uh, museum institutions at Yale. So the solution for the digital asset team was to have a back end that was triple IF compliant. And then the IIP move viewer can consume that on the front end. Uh, and then other viewers like OpenSea Dragon can also be used when it's appropriate. And for the museum community, particularly uh, at Yale, um, study of the images is, is very important. So spectral imaging uh, has taken on a large role in the work that they do. And here you see three different uh, spectral images of a single image. Uh, and as John pointed out, there is a single canvas that all of those images are attached to. Uh, and what that means is that there are layers of images uh, that are attached to a single sort of abstract canvas, which means that when the Yale scholars and curatorial staff start to annotate those spectral images, um, they don't have to recreate a new annotation for every image. They simply attach it to the canvas in the place where it's supposed to be, uh, and then layer up the images as appropriate for the viewer. So, with a uh, triple IF backend, we step out to a quick walkthrough of what Yale has available. And we can take a look at the raw image coming out of the Yale uh, image server. And as John pointed out earlier, there is a URL syntax here that's common. Um, if Yale had not decided to make the images fully open, uh, their servers could restrict the viewing uh, size of the image perhaps to a percentage, um, but it's pretty easy for Yale's situation to bump that up uh, so that you've got more like a full image experience just raw. What that means is that through the Yale Center for British Art catalog, they can offer a zoom option plus all of the deep, rich, descriptive metadata that they have, as well as internal links and, um, and persistent URLs for that particular experience that they want to curate for the users coming through the, the museum site. 
in the Zoom viewer, then they have IIP uh, Move viewer on the front end. It's consuming that same image. Um, but because Yale has opened up a IIIF backend, we can also drop that image into Mirador. And so this is a, sitting on a server that's neither at Stanford nor at Yale, but just out in the, out in the world. Uh, I'm consuming the image directly from Yale, and I could build up a series of displays around that, including dropping in uh, some descriptive metadata. And here, it's very important to point back to the Yale Center for British Art. They can track my use of that image on their end, because I'm just consuming it every time I, I bring up the client. Uh, and I never have taken their image outside of the context that they're comfortable uh, serving it in. So, so long as I'm respecting the rights that they want shown, uh, then I can start adding up annotations on top of this particular uh, instance of the image and making those annotations available back, uh, should they want them. Which leads us pretty quickly into a world where we might see fairly rich environments being built. So the picture that I showed you just a moment ago was Stonehenge done by a follower of Constable in 1836. The famous Stonehenge uh, that Constable did in 1835 is here. Uh, but we could start building up a display in an environment like Mirador or another IIIF consuming client uh, where we could bring together uh, content from within a single institution, in this case, the Stonehenge plus two sketches at the VNA or from external uh, servers as well. So the British Museum also has a, a rather contemporary sketch, 1835-ish, of, uh, of that Stonehenge by Constable. And we could also start tacking on images of text-based content, like letters written by the artist at the time, uh, lists of exhibitions where the uh, artwork was exhibited, essays by scholars and curators or conservators about different aspects of the uh, object, and start bringing in related works held at other institutions uh, or exposing our own content out that way, as well as building up a bibliography along the way. Uh, so we've got all of that, but you could also imagine that uh, being supported by publishers or uh, vendors in the community. Uh, so this doesn't rely on openness necessarily. It's a nice thing, but it could certainly also be something that, uh, that we see coming in the publishing world um, or through paid clients. So we'll end there. We invite you to communicate with us by the uh, IIIF discuss list um, or any other way you see fit, including talking to us directly. And I'll turn it back to Simon now. So guys, if you just come yeah. have a seat. And, uh, yeah, let's go for some questions. Uh, I'd love to see you're, you're up and ready to go. Yeah, ready to go. <laughs> Excited. Uh, great presentation. Thank you. Um, but I have two questions, like one's logistical and one's kind of technical. Um, uh, if you were an institution and you were to implement a server, like what, what are your options for like broadcast or discovery? Um, and then I'll just ask my second question and sit down. Uh, the second question is if you're an institution and implement a server, um, what are your protections like against say maybe good intentioned but inexperienced developers who are maybe like over consuming a full res image um, that, like you want to make available but also don't want it to be you know sucked down 100 times an hour so uh i think i'm gonna need some clarification on your first question so i'll, yeah. I'll start with your second uh um there is no direct uh protection there is one uh thing i i left off at, in the interest of time, I'm gonna go back and show. Which is, this is still on, right? That uh, in the image information syntax uh, of the API, That's really friendly looking, isn't it? Uh, well, if this were formatted better, <laughs> usually it, it gets uh, formatted in like an expand contract thing. Uh, there's a distinction between the native width and height uh, of the image, which you need for sort of doing math and making requests, and the sizes 
that are actually available to you, right? So buried here in this hierarchical structure. Let me font that up. Uh, buried here uh, are the actual sizes you can get. So if you had, which is actually the perfect case for us with this massive scroll we have online uh, uh, at Princeton, if you requested that whole thing even once, uh, everybody else using the server is going to suffer for a while, right? So we, so, so you need the, you need the absolute uh, width and height, which are uh, here, you know, for the sake of calculating aspect ratios in, in your request. But that doesn't mean that you have to advertise uh, the full size, which would be, in this case, we are, which would be here as a size that's available to you. So. Um, and then it's up, it's up to you to, to restrict that in your, in your client. But the contract is that if it's not there, you shouldn't ask for it. Uh, so can you explain your first question? First question is, in, in your in your initial demos, you, 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 you had a drop-down list of institutions that had uh, implemented um, your, your API specification. Um, is there a way for those institutions to kind of broadcast and say, hey, I'm, I'm doing this? Yeah, so that's that's... Do you want to take that? Or, uh, okay, that's that's what I was getting at with the discovery question because it's come up a lot. As the so far, it's worked pretty well that we all know each other, <laughs> uh, 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 but already that's that's obviously not the case, and and, uh, and and we don't want it to be the case, right? Um, uh, so so that is an outstanding question. One proposed solution is. Um, if you remember in the early days when everybody was excited about XHTML and they had these little badges on their uh, screen like valid, you know, XHTML, strict, whatever. Some mechanism like that that would make it possible to sort of not only advertise there's, that there's a manifest available for this thing but actually drag it to somewhere. Um, that would work for manifest. For images, uh, uh, Google has an image sitemap uh, syntax that we've been uh, thinking about, although I don't know if anybody's actually done it yet. So if, if can I ask uh, who you are and from what institution? Uh, I'm actually from an agency, so we're doing all the work with the Museum of Art. Cool. We're talking about how to maybe expose their collection. Yeah. So it's a great question, and it's it's like the the now roadmap for the next wave of discussion. So as we kind of closed out Image API 2.0 and Presentation API 2.0, those three or four topics that John put up on his list and how we discover resources we get. How do I know what the IIIF resources are out there is the big question. We rely a lot on the aggregators. This is why we're instigating this discussion with the aggregators, but any institution should be able to discover the resources that are available through these APIs. The sitemap option is one, there are others, and yeah. we invite you to participate in the conversation. So I just had a question. If right now, we have not implemented an image server. We have pre-computed derivatives and pre-computed tiles. And I guess I'm just wondering, are there things that we can do toward this right now, or do we need to have the ability to have arbitrary versions of images coming out of that before we can implement even a part of this? Can you say where you're from, please? I, I start with anyone. Okay, thanks. Uh, yeah, so the, yes, uh, we, we were very conscious of that use case uh, when we designed the image specs. Um, you do need to respect the syntax, uh, but we've introduced the notion of levels of compliance from zero up to two, and kind of two plus. There's a bunch of optional stuff that you don't have to do. Maybe Stu will bring that up. Uh, level zero compliance is that uh, a canonical URI syntax that we've defined uh, works, and that the sizes you advertise uh, as being available work. Uh, and if you say tiles uh, at these different scale factors uh, are available, it works. Uh, but how, however you get there, whether it's a, a dynamic service or just cached uh, tiles on a file system that, that uh, resolve when you build that path uh, in the URL, that's perfectly fine. Uh, that's, that's completely legit. So, you, so I guess the short answer is yes, you have to use the syntax, but by no means do you have to have this sort of dynamic everything in the kitchen sink service at all. And, and, and the canonical URI syntax is the thing you want to look for as a spec right. uh, uh, to sort of bring that out. And we've made it a goal to have as many clients as possible respect that. So you so Open Sea Dragon certainly does. Uh, and so you can get that level zero, I think. I think level zero. Thank you. 
Um, I've got a th thank you for a really useful presentation. Um, I've got a couple of questions, one very yeah. and one yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't think of my word. It's not <laughs> sublime to ridiculous, whatever it is. So the first one is, is not yeah. sure I can tweet. Um, which is just, uh, and I think you've been alluding to it, but it's, an, and we've been working on a number of projects with IP Image and with OpenSea Dragon. And um, in particular, it, it's come as a shock to me that uh, certainly the IIP image, there isn't an option that says, you mentioned the sort of the bank syntax for dimensions, estimation mark, uh, to say, give me something that will fit into this box uh, but that, and, and retain proportion, but there doesn't seem to be an option that says, but don't scale bigger than your source image. And I think what you were telling me there was that when the uh, info.json advertises a set of possible sizes, but actually there's no restriction on saying, but you know what, I don't like it this size, so I'm gonna have a big full scroll anyway. You, one of you is nodding away there saying like, that's a problem, the other one's nodding <laughs> and saying like, yeah, this is a real yeah. issue. Uh, so, the, so there's two things, one, uh, the, um, it's an optional feature to support upsampling. Uh, we don't say in the spec that at any level of compliance that's something you have to do. Right. If you do do it, uh, in, these, uh, in the info.json document that I had up there, but is useless because it's not formatted, you actually have to say explicitly, I can do this. Right. And if you can't, then your client should, the, the, the image server should, should send you uh, uh, some kind of fail response, a 400. Sorry, so in the request you say no upsampling? Uh, no, so if the server doesn't support it, it just won't work. Right. The problem if, I've got is the If you don't want it to, then that would be uh, up to the, uh, the client, client that you build yeah. uh, to, is, to do, is which again is why the metadata is available. I mean, it, granted that the, the bank syntax is, is in effect the convenience. If I can't be bothered to do the maths, give me 1024, 1024, but without saying the proportion, right. would it be an option maybe in the syntax say, and don't, I, I still can't bother to do the maths, don't upscale it either. Right. Take that down. As a, as a, yeah, thank you. Thank that's, you. That's, okay. that's great. Well, that was my, my, my little point. Um, yeah. My big one was, can you tell us anything more about the, the search within proposed syntax? We're quite interested in able to use that in a future revision. Sure. Uh, <laughs> thanks, guys. Uh, uh, <laughs> yes. Um, so, right. as with everything else, uh, AAAF, the last thing we want to do is invent another query syntax. Um, uh, we, we're fairly certain that the um, return syntax, um, another sort of advanced uh, uh, data structure we introduced in the presentation API is this notion of an annotation list. How that annotation list gets built, we don't really care. So if that annotation list is a, is a bunch of search results, great. So the response format part is, is pretty easy and more or less cooked. Uh, uh, the query syntax is the difficult part, and scoping it. Um, so you could imagine a, f uh, a phrase query, for example, that spans across two canvases, or even just across two annotations, if you've got line by line annotation. How do we handle that? Do we need to assume that the thing you're querying against is a manifest, or can we assume that there's some more structured uh, Full text somewhere else, you know, an Alto document or a TEI or a yeah. HOCR, whatever. Uh, so those are, those are the questions we're asking ourselves uh, 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 right now. That scoping question and what's the right um, query syntax. We know for sure we won't go into like relevancy ranking or, or anything. And is that something going on on the discuss list? Uh, it it is. We actually, we actually uh, Stu sent out an email last week uh, about us uh, requesting some user stories uh, uh, in that area with some more concrete use cases. Um, I think there's actually a GitHub re repository that they could be posted to. And John, did you did you, have you guys circulated the pro straw man proposal for search yet, or is that if it's if it got pushed to the website, then yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, but I, th I think the answer might be. Yeah, because there is a there is a there is a straw man proposal for how to deal with search, and it's another one of those kind of now conversations. We kind of spent three days in London talking about off discovery and search, and now the the next bit of work we have to do is 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 sort out how we want to approach it. So it's a good time 
to, to um, kind of get in on that. Um, as John mentioned, we're also kind of gathering use cases, like user stories from people, so especially encourage the museum community to tell us, like, what are your kind of use cases and how do they apply. We probably have room for one last one. Yeah, yeah so. I, just, um, I was mildly, uh, great work. I was mildly interested when I came in, but it took until we got to the slide where you showed what the British Museum was doing with the shared canvas and the composition of what could be done beyond image, because it's kind of like so many museums use it, look at, at use cases that are, I have images, let's look at them. We're doing a digital archive where the scanned image is just the first step in then segmenting the document, uh, text transcribing, annotating, all that stuff. Um, in specific to the mention of the, the British Museum, I'm working with Dominic Oldman and Barry uh, Norton uh, who have a project funded research project at the British Museum called Research Space. I'm specifically working on composable SIDOC CRM microservices for curational activity. And this would be so perfect for us. So if, if that sounds interesting to you, we need to talk. So, so um, uh, and can you say? Oh, I'm Jim Salmons. The project uh, is Fact Miners and the Soft Talk Apple project. Cool. Yeah, uh, our second day in London we're, was we're, we're unfunded, um, unaffiliated, uh, and independent, which gives yeah. us a great, we make great partners because we can do anything. Awesome. <laughs> Welcome aboard. <laughs> um, and and, and, and uh, my first MCN, and thanks to Picton for my uh, scholarship to be here. I'm glad you're here. Uh, just, just, just quickly, let's talk afterwards. Uh, our second day in London was hosted by the British Museum, and Barry gave us a presentation on research space. Um, we've been talking to Dominic, so um, we'd love to talk to you more. Absolutely. Great. I'm afraid we've uh, run out of time. Uh, yesterday, uh, when we did the, the exercise of the keynote, someone said, why are you here? They said, because they want to meet all the cool kids. I think you've all demonstrated that there's a whole load of cool kids in the room, so thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, see you later.